Last time on Sailor Moon, two talking cats named Luna and Artemis gathered together a group of superheroes known as the Sailor Guardians. Together, they had to take on Queen Beryl's evil scheme to purify the world's drinking water. Refresh! <clears throat> Narrator, did you even watch the first season? Uh, yeah, I've watched the first season. Really? You did? You paid attention to the first season. I mostly watched it for the transformation sequences. <laughs> that makes a lot more sense. Definitely makes a lot more sense. Welcome! I am the Kaiju no Kami, and tonight I'm going to be reviewing a pirate's favorite Sailor Moon series, Arrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
The silver crystal now becomes Usagi's brooch to transform, while everyone else acquires new pens that also give them new attacks. Mars's burning mandala attack is probably my favorite of the new attacks. In addition, Usagi receives a new scepter called the Cutie Moon Rod. Moon Princess! Other than that, not too much changes with the characters as far as personalities go, but we do get some developments between Usagi and Mamoru. Mamoru also lost his memories after Barrel's defeat, yet Luna for some reason refuses to return them to him. We're only thinking about restoring the other girls' memories right now so you'll be able to fight together as guardians again. Thus, he spends the first arc pondering why Usagi is always trying to cling on to him, while the second arc has him having dreams that forces him to break up with Usagi because reasons. To stand strong against this enemy, unless the two of you share an unbreakable bond of love, you will not be able to overcome the danger you will face. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That is why I tested your love. Okay. Um... Can you repeat the part of the stuff where you said all about the things? To stand strong against this enemy, unless the two of you share an unbreakable bond of love, you will not be able to overcome the danger you will face. That is why I tested your love. That's the stupidest idea I've ever heard! I mean, I guess the reason that is given towards the end of the arc is sound? It just makes little sense. I do get a laugh out of every time he shows up his tuxedo mask as he has to always make some random speech as if he is the morality police. Promise bracelets are the strands of hope. Young girls put their faith in them, but you with your ugly heart shatter their faith! Though, it does also bring some comedic moments occasionally from other characters. Uh, what? While it's true that sweet treats can melt away one's worries, there are other times when it is the sugar that melts instead. Okay, you've lost me this time around. The image of love shimmering in the sun. Come, you sad lost soul. Listen to the sound of a loving heart. Huh? Oh, I hate how much you blabber! <laughs> I love it. Due to Mamoru's lost memories in the first arc, that also means he is not Tuxedo Mask. As such, he isn't able to save Sailor Moon every episode, so what does this mean? Well, it means we have a new character to pull her ass out of the fire, a man dressed in white calling himself the Moonlight Knight. Prince Ali, fabulous he, Ali Ababwa. Can you flex, show some respect, down on one knee. Now try your best to stay calm. <laughs> I made a rhyme, get it? The man who dresses in white calls himself the Moonlight Knight? <laughs> Seriously though, he's totally Mamoru. Oh great, now another weirdo's appeared. <gasps> They're here together, so Mamoru isn't the Moonlight Knight? Let me just say, I admire your courage. No, he's not Mamoru, but he looks like Mamoru, he sounds like Mamoru, he must be Mamoru. Don't know who he actually is because you haven't seen this show? Well, I'm going to wait till you see it to find out for yourself who this mysterious person is. Spoiler warning, it's kind of dumb, even by Sailor Moon standards. Most of the secondary characters like Usagi's friends and family take a massive sidestep this season into becoming more obscure, especially Umino, who sometimes it feels like the writers forgot he and Naru were going out with each other. Speaking of Naru, I do like some of the digs made at her this season since she always seems to find herself under a monster attack in one way or another. Boy, that girl sure gets her energy drained a lot. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> 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 How I seem to have a knack for getting involved in strange situations, I'm worried this might be another one of those. At least she knows her place in life. With that said, that doesn't mean the characters end here as there are a couple of new characters introduced during this season. First up is the pink haired girl from the future who is also named Usagi and becomes known as Chibi Usa by everyone in the present time. She travels to the past from the 30th century to acquire the silver crystal and spends half of her arc trying to figure out which guardian has it. I'm sure is responsible. I think that she would be more likely to have the silver crystal than someone as immature as Usagi. Chibi Usa initially starts out as a selfish brat whom we soon come to learn is really just desperate over anything else. After all, at the end of the day she is still just a little kid, albeit a highly intelligent, dim-witted one. They hurt my mommy! And made her end up like that! And even daddy couldn't beat them! 
she instantly finds herself attracted to Mamoru, and while sometimes it can feel a tad creepy, there is a good reasoning behind it. Mamo, it can't be true that you have a girlfriend, can it? Still kind of creepy though. Being that the season does deal with time travel, we come to learn that in the 30th century Neo Queen Serenity and King Endymion rule the Earth in a new silver millennium, with Tokyo being their kingdom's homeland, deemed Christo Tokyo. How, you ask? That is a really good question. A fantastic question even. A superb question. Next question. Our final new character is another Sailor Guardian, the Guardian of Time and Space, Sailor Pluto. Wait a minute. How can she be a Sailor Guardian if Pluto is not a planet? She should at least be a dwarf. We don't learn too much about her aside from the fact that she must always stand guard at the doors of time, though I'm not exactly sure how that works. Science. Either way, she cares for Chibi Usa and does help when she can. Oh, does this mean you're not angry? No, I'm very proud of you. You finally mastered the space-time key. Lastly, I have already talked about Usagi's voice actress in my review of Sailor Moon Crystal's first season, so I wanted to just name the rest of our core characters off here. On the English side of things, Ami is voiced by Kate Higgins, Christina V is Ray, Amanda Miller plays Makoto, Shirmi Lee follows Monaco, and Robbie Draymond voices Mamoru. For their Japanese counterparts, you have Aya Hisakawa, whom you may know as Kiro Beros in Cardcaptor Sakura, Michi Tomazawa, Ami Shinohara, Hara, Rika Fukami, and Gundam and Dragon Ball's Toru Furuya. In addition to them, Chibi Usa is voiced by Sandy Fox and Kei Araki, Sailor Pluto is voiced by Veronica Taylor and Chiyoko Kawashima, while both Michelle Ruff and Keiko Han voice Luna, with Power Rangers alumni Johnny Young Bosch and Toku voice actor Yasuhiro Takato portray Artemis. You can't go wrong in either language, as the show is top notch in both, except for one moment when Ray decided to sing a song. I'm not about to ignore you, I will save you, after all, no one's closer than me. Yeesh, yeah, Christina V is quite terrible there. Especially compared to Tomazawa. <laughs> Uh, on second thought, they're both pretty bad at singing in this scene. Maybe Christina V isn't totally at fault. Oh. The villains. Unlike our heroes, all our villains here are brand new, and we get treated to two sets of villains. The first arc brings to us the duo of Ion Anne, along with the root of all evil stemming from the Makai tree. Makai tree? Hey, uh, have you guys tried calling in the Makai Knights to exterminate these pests? Something strange in your neighborhood. Who you gonna call? Kidding aside, Alan and our lone survivors are their race, and they have brought their tree to Earth to gather energy in the hopes of revitalizing it, for if it dies, they die. As you can see, it's running low on the life energy that's so vital to our survival. Well, we're fortunate because this planet seems to be filled with life energy. They take on human forms, posing as siblings, and go to Usagi school since the Juban district is the only district in the world, and try to gather their energy from there using a group of monsters known as Cardians. Come forth, Cardian Amanju! There's a clown. A minotaur. And, uh. How does Usagi describe this one? Vampires who look like drag queens. 
Anyway, they start to find themselves with strange feelings as An falls in love with Mamoru while Ayo has the eyes for Usagi. They naturally cause jealous amongst each other, making them appear as the weirdest siblings ever. Unless you have watched the hundreds of incest anime out there, then this is pretty tame. Still creepy and weird. There is a tragic backstory to be told here that really separates the couple from your other Sailor Moon villains, but I can't dive into it deeper without giving away spoilers. It's a pretty solid, though repetitious arc. Now the second arc is where things get really interesting with a group known as the Black Moon Clan. The Black Moon Clan are descendants to a group of beings who were exiled by Neo Queen Serenity to the 10th planet known as Nemesis. Our ancestors resented having to leave the fine planet of Earth and being forced to live here on Nemesis. And I, for one, have not forgotten our plan to rewrite Earth's history so that we may reap our revenge! With the help of a strange cloaked prophet known as Wise Man, You must find the Silver Crystal as soon as possible, and destroy it. He looks more like the ghost of Christmas future. The clan's prince, Demand, attacks the Earth on a quest of vengeance for his ancestors' unjust punishment. Together with the help of his alchemist brother, Saphir, and his servants, they managed to nearly destroy Crystal Tokyo until a beam of light surrounded the palace to keep them out. Thus, he sends his general and G.I. Joe reject Rubius to the 20th century of Japan to destroy Crystal Tokyo from the past while also trying to kill the rabbit, also known as Chibi Usa. <laughs> Kill the wabbit, kill the wabbit. In addition, Rubius brings with him a quartet of siblings known as the Spectre Sisters to do his bidding. Among the group is the youngest sister, Cohen, who is blinded by her love for Rubius that she believes he feels the same. Don't disappoint me again, my love. Oh, I won't, you can count on me! He called me my love. He does love me. I should never have doubted it. Denial is not just a river in Egypt. Next up is Berthier, who just wants her sisters to love her. Well, even if somehow I had failed, I wouldn't dream of asking my older sisters to help out. What a relief that you didn't have to. The stingy Calaveras. This assignment may be beneath me, but now that I think about it, it's not a good idea to anger Master Rubius. And the Otis, who hates all men after a bad breakup, pets. I'm going to kill you so you'll shut up about stupid things like being in love and wish for love to come back. While they may not be anywhere near the threat levels held by the four heavenly kings in the first season, they do bring an interesting dynamic by all being siblings as they constantly bicker with each other as siblings do. What about you wearing that striped bodysuit in this heat? Are you trying to hide some blotchy skin or something? That was mean! I demand an apology! It's nice to see them grow as the story continues and their fates add a nice change of pace from your normal villains. Rubius is pretty much wallpaper as far as development goes, which is fine since he's eventually replaced by the far more interesting, obnoxiously loud Esmeralda. I don't plan on failing like that flop, Rubius. <laughs> That's quite enough cackling, Esmeralda. Like Cohen, Esmeralda believes Demand loves her and devotes herself to his whims. She also has some great moments, whether it's facing off against the Sailor Guardians. Oh, you're a hottie. <laughs> Farewell. Well, you're just skinny, pimply schoolgirls with flat chests and flat butts. Who are you calling flat? We prefer to think of ourselves as small but toned, old lady. Stuffing her face with cake. <laughs> oh, how can this be so good? I've never tasted anything like this. Or getting peed on by animals. Being as beautiful as I am is such a curse. Hmm? <laughs> you stupid! Not, I'm not a fire hydrant! There's even a moment where her bath time is interrupted by Saphir, who proceeds to hold a conversation with her regardless. Esmeralda, time to get out. Really, Saphir? I think it's very rude to spy on a woman while she's bathing. Get over it. Are you sure you two aren't the lovers? After all, a true relationship is when one is in the bathroom, the other one goes to talk to that one and blatantly ignores that aspect. I can't go into more details on Demand without treading into spoiler territory, which is a shame since he may be my favorite Sailor Moon villain overall, but he has hands down what may be the best line of the entire show after Tuxedo Mask gives him a speech. How dare you use your evil depravity and demented power to try and force yourself on an innocent woman, you coward. Silence, you self-righteous prick. 
Sadly, the same goes for Wiseman and a woman named Black Lady. Black Lady's story may repeat a plotline from last season, yet it is quite effective. Nevertheless, the Black Moon Clan has far more depth than all three iterations of the Dark Kingdom combined. As for the clan's monsters of the week, they are simply known as droids. Droid. These are not the droids you are looking for. There's a couple that I really like, such as this drum beater monster, a monster that can turn people into donuts. <laughs> Jupiter! Watch out! She's too fast with her sugary blast! Donuts! The original Whole Foods. This ice monster. Oh, Nephus. Right. <laughs> Sleep tight, kitty. Sometimes you just gotta let it go. And this dude that terrorizes Chibius's dreams. Kill the wabbit, kill the wabbit, kill the wabbit. Ultimately though, the Monsters of the Week are by far this season's weakest aspect. Neither the Cardians or the Droids are really all that thrilling compared to the monsters the Dark Kingdom threw at our characters. Sometimes it feels like a Cardian or Droid is there simply because the show needed to have a Monster of the Week. The animation and music. Due to the show starting the week after the first season ended, nothing has changed as far as animation and music is concerned as it is the exact same animation and the same soundtrack. It still features the same static backgrounds, lifeless background characters, lively central characters that display a wide array of emotions depending on the situation, some comedic imagery, Not it! And the same still shots for battle footage. <laughs> Nevertheless, it is still enjoyable, it still works for the show, it's just nothing spectacular. There are a couple of fantastic pieces of animation during key scenes, especially during a big battle sequence between the Guardians and the Spectre Sisters, among some other images in the later portion of the show. Naturally, the attack and transformation animations remain top notch. The vast majority of the show's score is exactly the same as it was in the previous season, even down to the same opening theme, though there are a few new pieces of music to be heard throughout. I especially love this song. <gasps> it's not here! Where'd it go? I hate her so And the one from the final battle. You're wasting your time! Now that the dark gate is open. There is a new ending theme from Makoto Nagai titled Ultimate No Policy. I like this song better than the previous two ending themes as it's got a good beat to it. Then aside, there's nothing else to really talk about here. The episodes. Being that the show is separated into two arcs, with the Black Moon Clan changing their objective halfway through their arc, the show never feels stale. It's still the Monster of the Week show the first season was, so if it didn't work for you then, it won't work for you now. There are a wide array of episodes that are enjoyable, with only one or two I dislike, while there is one I absolutely despised. More on that in a moment, as I also wanted to talk about how you could play a drinking game on how many times they have to call a character's name out. There is one episode where I am so happy they reminded me that Usagi's name is Sailor Moon, as I might have forgotten if they hadn't. Sailor Moon! Sailor Moon! Sailor Moon! Sailor Moon! Come on, Sailor Moon, say something! Make it stop! Sailor Moon! Sailor Moon! Sailor Moon might die! Sailor Moon! Wake up! Sailor Moon! Sailor Moon! Sailor Moon!
There are a lot of strong episodes, such as the ones I mentioned with Nurse Monaco, another where she helps out a bratty kindergartner, and the aforementioned episode where Esmeral discovers the joys of cake. But my favorite episode is without a doubt the one titled Protect Chibi Usa, Clash of the Ten Warriors. This episode sees Chibi Usa doubting Usagi and her friends, missing her home, and trying to return only to find herself being hunted by Rubius and the Spectre sisters. Why are you after her? We are on a mission to change the future of this metropolis. All of the events lead to a huge battle with a pretty kick-ass new song to boot. Playtime is over. It has some of the best animation of the entire season, and while a lot of the fight scenes continue its still shot barrage, the entire concept is so well done that I don't even mind it. It worked. It's also the game changing episode where Usagi eavesdrops on Chibi Usa's conversation with Pluto, learning a few aspects of her character. She hurt my mom. As for my least favorite episode, or in this case, what may be the worst episode of the entire series, even with this season featuring a clip show. Yes, you heard that right. This episode is inferior to even a clip show. Is the one titled The Beach, The Island, and a Vacation, The Guardian's Break. This episode sees our heroines vacationing on some beach when Chibi Usa gets surrounded by sharks only to be rescued by a dinosaur. A dinosaur. A freaking dinosaur. <laughs> now, the concept of a dinosaur is not the issue here. Well, not completely the issue here. It is Sailor Moon. They live in a universe with reincarnated girls who transform into sailor uniforms to fight evil monsters that want to take over the Earth. The aspect of a dinosaur doesn't sound too far-fetched, except the dinosaur is a plesiosaur, which is a dinosaur with flippers. Therefore, it was restrained to the sea. However, this plesiosaur can walk on land too, even though its body weight would render this impossible. What the? <laughs> Dear Lord, that's the loudest profanity I've ever heard. Now there's another issue. This episode has Makoto saying this. Where'd you learn to drive a boat, Mako? Eh, I can do anything. Which is where they tell us these characters can do anything the plot requires. No, no, no. It does not work like that. You have to set up ground rules for your show, otherwise it renders every conflict moot. If the characters can do whatever they want to solve the problem, it's never a problem, and that means it's just 200 episodes of girls that can do anything without any repercussions or obstacles getting in the way. When you have that, it takes away all sense of excitement or suspense. Of course we know the girls are going to win out in the end, but they should not know that. When your characters are written to know they are invincible, like the modern day Homer Simpson, it stops the show from being about a group of characters dealing with the struggles of life and a show about gods acting like jerks because they are letting other people suffer while they dilly dally around in their own selfish egos. I'm sure there's a simple explanation for all this. Eh, I can do anything. I hate, hate, hate this episode. It's stupid, it's dumb, it's annoying. The movie. In case you didn't know, Sailor Moon R has a movie. It features a being named Fiore, who is from the same race as Island An, returning to Earth after 15 years to recapture his affections for Mamoru, who comforted him after the death of his parents. Sorry, you can't have him. It's just that Mamo is my boyfriend. Unfortunately for Mamoru, Fiore brought with him an evil flower monster that wants to take over the Earth with some really bad CGI. It's an interesting film with outstanding animation. <laughs> 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 
funny dialogue, especially since Fiori recognizes Usagi after transformation. You again! Uh, you're that girl from yesterday. An interesting story and nearly all new music. Not to mention, Fiori has one of the most hilarious lines out there. It's all over. Mamoru. He just he threw a flower at me. <laughs> he hit me with a flower. <laughs> oh, and Chibi Usa apparently tries to murder Usagi. It's kind of by the book as far as stories go, as you know the Sailor Guardians are going to win in the end, but it's still a fun ride. We shouldn't spy on them. You guys, it's just wrong. It's wrong. <gasps> what? Finally, it gives us what is the most badass final battle music of the entire franchise with a song titled Moon Revenge. <laughs> Sailor Moon R is a worthy successor to Sailor Moon as it improves upon the first season in almost every category, especially the villains. The Black Moon family may very well be the deepest group as far as the series rogues are concerned. Unfortunately, due to that Chibi Usa episode with the dinosaur, I have no choice but to give Sailor Moon R a 4 out of 5 grown-ups in spandex. If you enjoyed the first season, you will no doubt be thrilled with the improvements this one has, despite its little negatives. If not, you know not to bother. Until next time, bye.